What's going on, football fans? It's time once again for another rendition of the Pound for Pound. I'm your host, J.R. Clark, and today we're going to continue talking about the draft. The reason why we're going to continue talking about the draft because I know, like me, many of y'all had the, you know, Scooby-Doo her look on your face when some of these names were called. And I kind of want to touch on that. Uh, not only do I want to touch on the fact that I've now had a little bit of time to watch some game film, read some more articles, uh, and things of that nature, but I also want to touch on the fact that sometimes our expectations don't meet reality. And sometimes our expectations can, can get a little skewed, you know what I'm saying? And what I mean by that, and this, this happens every year, and I probably said something along the lines last year, and I'll probably say something along the lines again next year. But we go into draft night, or you know, the, the draft season, consuming so much draft content, whether it be mock drafts by you know various outlets and networks, or doing your own mock draft on fan speak, and you know, looking at these people's big boards and stuff like that. And a lot of times when draft night actually hits past the first like five or six picks, it's kind of haywire from there. Um, I can remember uh, when Dallas Cowboys picked Travis Frederick as uh, in the first round and everybody was like losing their mind, making fun of him and poking at him and saying, oh, you guys are crazy. And then, you know, he ends up being one of the, the best center in the league for a few years, you know, still is, but I think he's battling with some uh, medical issues right now, but, you know, still extremely good center. So I guess what I'm saying is that just because your favorite analyst doesn't necessarily agree with what we've done or somebody else doesn't necessarily agree with what we've done or hell, you don't even agree with what we've done. It doesn't make it a bad draft and doesn't make it a bad pick. You know what I'm saying? Um, so just, you know, kind of keep that in mind. I mean, Heck, I, I fall for it just like anybody else. I was extremely, like, very much expecting us to go defensive line first round, you know, but um, that's not where they saw the value. That's not what they decided to do, you know. And, and after watching some more, you know, Chris Lindstrom and and um, uh, Caleb McGray, or McGarry, excuse me, I think I was saying McGray, but it's McGarry, um, Oh man, I, I'm actually quite pumped, you know, about these picks and about what this means for our team going forward, you know. Um, I think I saw a stat where last year um, Chris Lindstrom allowed like 1% pressure all year. 1% out of the 300 and something snaps he took. 1% pressure. That is awesome i don't think we've had a guard like that in a while i don't know if we've had one of those in matt ryan's career now i don't know if this is going to necessarily translate to the nfl because that's always the big guess but i'm extremely hopeful i mean you want a, an example go pull up on youtube the boston college game versus clemson there are a few times where he goes one-on-one -on -one with Christian Wilkinson. You know, the guy who got picked right before us, the one that I know myself I wanted real bad. I wanted him next to Grady like I couldn't even see straight. But he went one-on-one -on -one with Christian Wilkinson and fared really well and won more times than he lost. And so those, you know, that's promising. And then, you know, as far as Caleb McGarry goes, or, yeah, did I say McGarry again or McGray? I think it's McGarry. Anyway, big country is what I'm going to call him because that dude is massive. I don't know if you saw the, the photos of when he actually arrived at Flowery Branch. My God, that guy is like, I think like six, seven, three plus. I mean, that's a big dude. Um, but he's got that nasty streak, man. Uh, that nasty streak. I know in a lot of ways you need more than just a nasty streak, obviously. Um, I've seen some people not projecting him as a starter. I know, I think... Uh, uh, everybody on Twitter has been having fun with uh, D. Orlando Ledbetter and, and some of his comments and his great journalism. But if any of y'all pay attention to D. Orlando Ledbetter, then you're pretty familiar with his takes and opinions. Uh, sometimes I'm not 100% sure if he even likes the Falcons. 
Uh, I think he covers them because that's what he's, you know, paid to do, which is fine. Whatever. I mean, whatever floats his boat. But uh, anywho, like he's thinking that that uh, Caleb isn't going to be a starter, and he may not be. I don't know. But I'll tell you this: they're going to have probably the best competition that they've had uh, on that O line that I can't remember when. I don't think you'll have to see an emergency shipping off a fifth round pick to another team to get an O lineman or picking up some dude off the trash heap. I don't think we'll have to see that this year like we've seen in the past years. Uh, so that's something to hang your hat on, you know. I think you're going to see an offensive line that will be able to get those short yardage and and be able to keep, you know, your $150 million quarterback upright. So that's, you know, what I have seen off of those two offensive linemen has me really geeked, you know, and really uh, uh, charged up. But they're not the reason why I'm making this video. I mean, those are first-round picks. They should be, you know, solid. That's what you're hoping for. You know, that's what you want. Uh, but the reason why I've decided to uh, dive deeper into the, in this video is the the, the fourth-rounders that I'm really excited about. Um, <clears throat> and is like with the fourth-rounders and uh, the fifth-rounders, the, the later-round guys. Um, that John Kaminsky. I had a real tough time trying to find a University of Charleston game on YouTube to watch but because uh, I wanted more than just a highlight package because you can, um, I mean, you can make anybody look good with a, with a good highlight package, with a good sizzle reel. You know, that's why it's called a highlight package, you know. Uh, I'm sure you can make my rotund self look, look good uh, in, a, in a highlight package, but uh, if you edit it right. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, watching a little bit of his the, the actual game, uh, I like how active he is. Now I know he's still, you know, new to to playing defense. Uh, I know, I'm sure by now you've heard his story. Stepped on campus at like 205 to be an option quarterback, and you know, four years later he's uh, 286 and playing defensive end. That's awesome. That's amazing that he has the drive to do that. But <coughs> uh, he's still raw is the word that you hear a lot coming out of, you know, Division II. Uh, I don't hold that against anybody because uh, I believe that if you can play, you can play. It doesn't matter where you're playing at or what talent you're playing against. If you can play, it's going to translate, you know. And so we're going to see if, if Buddy is a baller or if Buddy is a buster, you know. Uh, but my what I think I see is like he he scored real high in a lot of his testing, you know, in, in every stage from the East West game to the uh, Senior Bowl to the Combine. It seemed like he improved, right, and got better and and stepped up to the competition. Uh, real interesting. Go uh, go watch the Senior Bowl. Uh, it's on YouTube. Generally, is uh, I know I watched part of it. Um, I saw what bit I did get to see. I saw him bat down a pass, you know, so that's uh, that's good to see that when the competition stepped up, so did he, you know. What has me real excited about Kaminsky is that I think that he could end up, maybe not this year, maybe some, well, maybe some this year, but I think he could end up being your Michael Bennett for this team, your what we tried to use Adrian Claiborne for. I think he can be the... The too fast for a guard to handle and also, you know, too powerful for, you know, defensive or uh, the left tackles and stuff. I think what I'm saying is I think that he could be that chess piece that Dan Quinn's been looking for. And he has a chance to now mold this guy in what he wants him to be. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, Vic Beasley is your true speed rusher. He should be your Leo in this in this package. Um, he should come from out wide uh, and and use his you know freakish speed to get to the quarterback. Then you have your you know your Tack McKinley, who's your traditional um, uh, defensive end, good in the run, good in the pass, strong anchor. And then I think you this Kaminsky kid could end up being a chess piece back and forth. But the one who really intrigued me in this draft after watching some of his film is that. Uh, 
the uh, Quadre, Quandre, Olison, the kid out of Pitt. I'm sorry, I have a tough time with names sometimes. I've uh, been practicing it all day, and now I'm here in front of the camera, and, and bleh. But uh, anyway, uh, Olison, the running back out of Pitt, is, I think, a back that we've been needing for a long time. And that's a bigger back that can move the pile, that can can run up inside in between those tackles. I mean, with, with Devontae and Ito, you've got powerful backs for what they are, but they're not pile-moving backs. And I know we have Brian Hill on the roster, but he hasn't shown enough yet. You know, maybe he will this year, but I, who knows? I don't actually expect him to make the roster. But uh, Olison from Pitt, you know, the game film that I've watched him, you know, you want to watch a couple interesting runs uh, and, and game, you know, go watch him against Clemson, against that defensive line. He popped off some good runs in, in that game, and, and that shows some, some good promise and and like I said he's he's the kind of back that I have been waiting on the Falcons to draft and hopefully you know uh they can use him good this season you know and um I know some of y'all were opining for Elijah Holyfield but I man his offseason really hurt him uh, I'm just going to be real frank with you his slow 40 times at his pro days um you know, I think he came in you know, a little little heftier than he played at. You know, he just didn't have a good off season, and and this whole off season, when you're a college player, man, that that's, it can make or break. It can shoot you up the board, like our old boy Kaminsky, or it can kick you off the board, like in the case of Holyfield. I know a lot of Georgia, you know, fans were uh, saw them chiming in on Twitter saying, "Oh, they should have drafted him. They should have drafted him." Well, it wasn't just the Falcons. It was 32 other teams that didn't draft him as well. I know he ended up in, I believe, in Carolina as an undrafted free agent, and, and it will suck if, if he ends up being good, you know, and, and you'll you'll look back and go, see, told you so. And if that ends up being the case, I'll have to say, you're right, I'm wrong. But I have to trust the guys who get paid to do this, you know. And uh, so that's uh, that's, you know, where I'm at on that stuff. But, you know, as far as, as, you know, did the Falcons do good this year? I mean, I said I thought they did good. You know, I thought they got a solid B, you know, for sure. Time will tell. If the more I'm reading and the more I'm uh, watching as far as these two offensive linemen, I think they knocked it out of the park with those two. And I think they're right to trade up for uh, Caleb McGarry or McGray. Um because I don't think he would have been there when we picked in the second round. I mean, I hated that we had to give up a third, but if they felt like that's what they needed, then I'm not going to be mad at them. And if nothing else, at least you get a fifth-year option. Because uh, as I don't know if y'all noticed, but as today, there's been a ton of fifth-year options that aren't being picked up right now, from you know Shaq Lawson to Eli Apple over in the Saints, uh, Josh Doxson of the Redskins, and so on and so forth. So there's a ton of fifth-year options that are, are getting passed over. So you just, you know, you hope that that's, you know, that we end up having good enough players that we, we pick those options up. And and if that ends up being the case, then we'll be glad we, you know, picked them in the first round where we had that fifth-year option because that gives you some, some flexibility going forward as far as signing these guys to big deals. So for the guys who... <clears throat> Don't think this draft made any sense. Hopefully, I cleared it up some more. It's straight up and down. Was mostly this whole offseason has been mostly about getting the run game going and keeping Matt Ryan upright, point blank. And they're doing it the best way they figured they can. Brought in some you know quality starters in free agency and then spent some high end draft capital on some to put forth the best offensive line that they can put forth. And if they pull that off, then, you know, come midseason, you'll be, you won't even be thinking about, oh, man, did they make a mistake? Because you'll be watching Free go for 100 yards, and you'll be watching Ito go for 100 yards, and, and you know, you'll be watching Julio, you know, catching the ball, and everybody else catching the ball because Matt Ryan's got all kind of time. It'll be very reminiscent of 2016, and that's what they're trying to get back to. So, as always, Falcons fans, rise up.